Stephen Gilbo is sticking to his guns. He's decided that the parliamentary budgetary officer is not as good of an economist as he is. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. Stephen Gilbo was responding to the parliamentary budgetary officer who went on with uh, Vashi Cabellas and um, how he disagreed wholeheartedly that he did say that he stopped looking at a certain number that the government refused to acknowledge was going to be a negative impact from the carbon tax. But even by removing that from his calculations, he still sees that as a problem. And now I'm going to let you hear it for yourself. The how Gilbo is just refusing to acknowledge to anybody. And it's one of those, you know, that's my story and I'm sticking to it, right? It's that same old patronizing concept that if you don't admit it, 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 sooner or later the other person is going to fall for it. Now we only look at the consumer charge, so obviously the impact is lower. It's not as much of a negative impact. But still, on average, the average household is still worse off when taking into account the economic. It's when he takes into account numbers provided, for example, by the government about the economic impact of the consumer portion of this, the, uh, the impact it will have, for example, on investment income and incomes more generally, that he arrives at the conclusion he did. You, you pointed out two things. First of all, that he didn't model out the benefits or the jobs created uh, associated with the, the carbon tax, nor the impact of climate change. On the first, and we'll go through both, on the first, what is the model for that? I, I, I have never heard from your government a specific amount of jobs that this tax specifically creates because I think it's clear just based on political reaction from like-minded premiers and politicians, not conservatives in this case, I'm thinking of David Eby and Wab Kanu and Jagmeet Singh and Andrew Fury, as well as people who are just existing in the world running small businesses, that they certainly don't feel that this has been r responsible for economic development, for example. Carbon pricing is generating about $25 billion of annual investment in clean technologies, in, in, in renewable energy, in, in zero emission vehicle technologies, batteries, and so on and so forth. Well, Vashi, let me tell you what he means. He means that he has no idea. If he had, let's remember something. If these guys have anything to say, they start to get very specific. They don't just hum and haw all oh, clean technologies and batteries and all of these kinds of things. Plus, let's not forget, Canada, let, let us remember that the $400 million they invested to try and create these green tech jobs was embezzled by their closest friends, was embezzled by their rich, big business supporters. So there can't be, but I'll tell you where he gets that number from. First, it, it, one of the uh, reports that came out last, you know, in the last session was, the negative impact of the carbon tax is about $25 billion a year. And of course, the that's when they started demanding that the PBO do a second report. So now rather than just say that he was the situation, he's just saying, oh, no, 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 no. We, we are generating $25 billion worth of things. So if you're generating $25 billion worth of something, are you trying to convince me that the all those people, including the PBO, missed it? That just didn't see it or you didn't submit that information to them. Is that it? You're just keeping that to yourself? There is no $25 billion. You only said that because you know that your tax is destroying the economy and you're desperate. I don't know why you're so desperate to try to convince people of something that they already know. Now, Gilbo tries to play the old, oh, if you don't agree with me, then you must take Canada and only the conservatives disagree with me. And he tries to slam Pierre Polyev. Of course, Vashi, to her credit called him on it and and made it such a good point that he really had no answer no no comeback it was pretty it was a pretty good burn so just listen if we're looking for a reason as to why Pierre Poliev is so opposed to this that's why because his rich friends uh, recently uh, oil executive uh, CEOs organized a fundraiser for for Pierre Poliev they're putting pressure on him to put an end to this I can assure you Vashi that oil executives aren't organizing fundraisers for me, not happening. When you're looking at the uh, fiscal and economic por portion of things or, or analysis of things, it's very broad based that Canadians are worse off. It's not just the highest quintile. Is it perhaps that 
and, and I like I let separate the conservative criticism for a moment because I know that's what your government likes to focus on. So much of that criticism comes from within your own your 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 own ranks, progressive side mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. politics. Like, is Wab Canoe against this because he wants oh, to help his rich friends? Is Andrew Fury against this because he wants to help his rich friends? No, I think in the case in both the case of Premier Fury and and the NDP, whether it's the the NDP in Manitoba, BC, or federal NDP, uh, they cave to the pressure. I mean, there is a lot of pressure on progressive politicians around this. It's not a progression, it's a regression. You're trying to take us back in time, not forward in time. So stop calling yourself progressive because you want people to think that you're making this change as an improvement for the humanity. Secondly, and this one is more important, why is there so much pressure on these politicians, on these far left politicians? Is it because the people that are on the far left also see that the system isn't working? Is it because the people on the far left are also see that they're suffering under the, the weight of this carbon tax? Could that be why? Do you want to tell yourself that they're feeling the pressure from their own constituents and they're losing uh, people in the polls and all of that stuff because people aren't feeling the pressure? Is that what you're trying to convince yourself or is that what you're trying to convince me of, MP Gilbo? Because I don't believe it for a, f a split second. I, you know, I see the difference between having an expense account and a chauffeured car and private planes versus the reality of having to go to the grocery store and see the prices go up and all that stuff that goes along with that. And I suspect that many of the people that support the far left are also feeling the pinch. So the reason that they're putting the pressure on those politicians is, could it be, Mr. Gilbo, that they're feeling the pressure because they are under pressure. Or is it just because you've decided that they're too, they're buckling under the pressure because all of the conservatives are pressuring them? Is that, is that what you're telling me? That Wab Canoe is buckling under the pressure of the conservatives? This guy, I'm telling you right now, I don't understand how these guys get elected. I really do not think to myself, like they must just not say anything, right? They must not just have to answer any questions. But I can tell you one thing, no matter what you tell this guy, he's always going to tell you that you're wrong. The next, I mean, she, you just heard her, right? She, she, she totally burned him. And he's like, oh, well, they're just caving under the pressure. Now she takes that sentiment of the pressure and she really wraps him up. Like it is excellent to see. It's a very good point, you know, but of course his answer leaves a lot to be desired. I mean, I say answer. But it's the, the word salad that comes out of his mouth is totally and utterly disconnected from the question that she asks. Uh, what role, though, did your government play in sort of, I guess, promulgating the kind of pressure that you describe that ultimately bared down on more progressive politicians in this country? And I'll tell you why I ask more specifically. So you point to economists that have labeled this as a, a very cost-effective way of doing things. There's probably nobody more at the forefront of that, and someone I've been interviewing for years on this subject, than Professor Chris Reagan, whom I also interviewed when your government gave a carve-out to home heating, which primarily affected Atlantic Canada. The Prime Minister made that announcement surrounded by Atlantic Canadian Liberal MPs. Mr. Reagan, Professor Reagan at the time, anticipated that that would be the death of this policy as written by your party so for you to be sort of you know critical of everyone else for caving to the pressure what responsibility do you bear for being the architect of that pressure <laughs> An institution on site who will label it properly it wasn't labeled properly before so people didn't even know they were receiving it or it wasn't like that six months ago uh Vashi. Um, so we're, we've put in place a number of things to ensure that there is a, a better understanding by Canadians of, of the benefit of the, the Canada carbon rebate. And, and, and it's changing. It's changing the debate. It let, for example, in July, last quarterly payment, more Canadians were talking about were talking positively about the Canada carbon rebate than Canadians were talking about acts to tax. Respectfully, though, Minister, I, I wasn't asking you about a communications difficulty. I was asking you about the role that, that your government played in creating the backlash to this by essentially offering a carve-out that was politically motivated to Atlantic Canada. And I know you're going to say it wasn't politically motivated, that there are other homes that qualify for this across the country, but 25% of the homes in Atlantic Canada use home heating oil versus, I think, it's 6% in the rest of the country. Plus, Minister Goody Hutchings came on this program about a year ago, somewhere in the neighborhood of that, and said, that if other parts of the country wanted to qualify for uh, a carve-out like that, they should elect more liberals. I remember that. I covered it. 
how the lady said with such disdain that if you want to get a break, a tax break, you're going to have to vote for the liberals because otherwise we don't, you know, she basically implied that she doesn't like anybody who's not on the far left and she will not govern anybody who's not on the far left. But I suppose that's a different video. I think we need to address the fact that she asked him, isn't his party responsible for that pressure by giving the car vote to the home heating oil people in Nova Scotia and doing it? I remember that. That was like, it, it was like right at the end of a Friday afternoon and he had every minister from Nova Scotia around him and they were saying, no, no, don't worry, don't worry because the polls are swinging bad, right? For the, for the liberals in, in all of these regions. And he answered with people now see that the carbon rebate is being labeled in the bank before they didn't know that they were getting this money. And he's trying to convince you that in July, more people were talking about it than they were talking about acts the tax, which I don't, I, there's nothing in my research that supports his contention. I believe that he's just hoping to, that he can say that and nobody will check it out. But I have run lots of polls on my channel and I listen to a lot of people talk about how the um, carbon tax is destroying their life. And no, there's nobody living paycheck to paycheck, which has got to be most of the country, right? I mean, from the middle class downward, it's a paycheck to paycheck. And they're not all of a sudden going to go to their bank and say, why do I have an extra hundred bucks? They'll know what's happening in their paycheck, right? In their bank account or whatever it happens to be, depending on what region you live in and depending on how many people are living in your house. At most, I think the largest one is Alberta for $400. And I think the smallest one is, is New Brunswick. But I, don't hold me to that. I, I remember I, I looked at the numbers one time, but I can't quite remember off the top of my head if it was New Brunswick or if it was Nova Scotia that were smaller. Either way, they're not that big. It's enough, though, that when a person is all of a sudden got an extra 400 bucks in their bank or 100 or whatever it happens to be, they're going to say, Hey, I got an extra hundred bucks in my bank. And do you want me to believe that with all the press these guys put on, I remember in July, they were talking about, Oh, we're well, getting their rebate and we're doing this. And we're doing like, cause there was also another one that came out for, uh, in, in July for, um, seniors. And they did a whole big push on Twitter about it. You want me to believe that because somebody put a, a title of it in the bank account that they, they all of a sudden are noticing it now. They noticed it, bud. I don't think for one second that they didn't notice it. And there's no pro, there's nobody in the country besides the press that is trying to tell people that it's a good thing. I, I assure you that people would happily stop paying the carbon tax at the pump, stop paying the carbon tax at the grocery store, stop paying the carbon tax just about everywhere. If they found a slower way to solve the uh, environment, they would have no issue with that whatsoever. Or if they had to just scrap the whole project and start to look for a new process altogether. You're not telling me that we're, we're just too stupid to know what's going into our bank. Is that what you want people to see? Like, is that the message that you're sending? Because it wasn't labeled in your bank. You didn't know what was happening. Oh man. I'm go lucky for us. We got uh, MP Gilbo to keep us from tripping over our own shoes and making sure we got them on the right feet. However, picking up from the question where that lady, the MP, the liberal MP said, you better vote liberal if you want to get a car vote on the carbon tax. He just kept rambling on and on and on. I can't speak to, to, to what my, my colleague said. What I can tell you is that in my home province of Quebec, where I am now, there are more Quebecers using home heating oil than in all of Atlantic Canada put together. Not so as a the, portion of the resources used, though. No, not in, but, but in absolute terms. There are more people in Quebec that use oil to heat their homes than in all of Atlantic Canada. That's, that's a simple fact. It's not proportionally, but, but in absolute terms. Now all of a sudden he cares about absolute terms. When the PBO says that in absolute terms, people aren't losing or aren't making any money. You said that he didn't know what he was talking about. And now you want to talk about absolute terms because there's more people in Quebec making, using home heating oil who are not under the federal backstop, by the way. So the home heating oil would have been done through the Quebec government, right? But Nova Scotia was done by the federal government. And the concept of carbon pricing is to incentivize different behaviors. And, and what we realized but home heating oil is that most of the people who are still using this form of, 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 of heating systems tend to be poorer uh, and, and not have the, the money necessary to invest into, into more efficient and, and cleaner heating systems. The pause is to help us put in place measures and we've deployed hundreds of millions of dollars across the country from BC 
to, 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 to the to Atlantic provinces, to the north, to help people make that transition so that, I mean, if, if, if you're using this tool to incentivize change, but people can't change because they don't have the mean to it, then, then it may be working from an environmental perspective, but it's certainly not working from a social perspective. And, and, and for But that's us, kind of the point, right? That's the point these, that uh, people these, in other parts of the country that aren't even using just home heating oil feel. They don't feel like it's easy to buy an electric car, for example, yet. And I know that your government has plans in place to help incentivize that further and help make that more affordable, but right now they just don't feel it is. And they feel like unless they elect liberals, that falls on deaf ears, deaf ears, pardon me. Climate change and fighting climate change is a societal challenge. So of course the federal government has a role to play provincial governments. Most of them aren't, but they should be, be, be part of this. But we want, to, we want to work with the public, which is why it's, it, it, it's kind of a carrot and stick approach. And in fact, in, in, in terms of home energy retrofit, it's in the billions of dollars. There's so many things he said there that I have an issue with that should be our, that are enormous red flags. I cannot believe that this guy has authority at all. First off, let me address this crack that he said, oh no, we've, we've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in, uh, in the retrofit. It's in the billions of dollars. You hear him say, uh, secondly, at the end. So billions of dollars of taxpayers' money are going in to give people heat pumps that won't work if, if for whatever reason the power gets cut out, like, like in Florida where 3 million people just were out of power when a hurricane comes through. And Nova Scotia gets the tail end of hurricanes all the time. Now you can say, well, yeah, but you need the, the, the furnace needs to have a, it really doesn't. You can just sit in the room with the furnace. You don't have to have the, the forced air, but they don't care about that, right? They just want you to think that the heat pump is all of a sudden going to be the, the answer while they desperately try to rebuild the entire electrical grid of, of entire provinces because the heat pump takes a lot of juice, a lot of juice. And in many places, the insurance company demand that you have a backup because when the power goes, the heat pump don't work. That's something that they're leaving out of the discussion. Then he said, oh no, I end up north. Excuse me, I pay attention to these things. Now up north, they were given a choice and they opted in to some of the programs that the liberal government were offering. Do you know what they chose? Wood burning stoves. And I don't blame them. I don't blame them that they wanted uh, wood burning stoves. Uh, new wood burning stoves for inside of their uh, building because you know then they can go outside cut down a tree or pick up some dead fall like some fall like what do they call it uh, dead fall I believe that's what it's called and they can just pick it up and burn it and keep themselves warm you know with the wood burning stove that's been around since I don't know since before I mean for a long time however he's not saying any of that and then he's talking about you know, electric cars, but nobody's going to use them. How are you going to plug the thing in? I mean, I, somebody left a comment on one of my uh, posts the other day that said, they said that some places are trying to encourage you to, the insurance company is trying to encourage you to park your car no closer than 50 feet to your house because they might randomly catch on fire. So now, do you understand the load that it's going to have to go into a 50-foot extension cord? The, the thing is going to have to be as thick as your forearm. And it's going to pull so much to just, just to get the distance from the house to the, to the car because it's, electricity works that way. And if it's cold, that line is going to really need to be insulated. Now, I get that maybe we won't be worrying about that in downtown Toronto or downtown Vancouver, but the rest of the country is going to be like, wait a second. We've established that electric is, doesn't have the torque, doesn't have the, um, can't, can't withstand the weight. I shouldn't have said torque, can't withstand the weight. And you can't plug it in. There's nowhere to plug it in. And where you do plug it in, all of that is powered by diesel. So I might as well just be driving a diesel. Really what we should be looking at is how we can clean the diesel, how we can get the, the diesel coming out of the car cleaner. Because that's why all of those people supported, all those oil industries gave the, the endorsement to Pierre Polyev, you know, because it creates jobs and it creates an economy and it creates money. And rather it's better to put that money into, instead of spending it on heat pumps, we're better off to put it onto things that'll keep the, the the emotions out of the air in a way that doesn't demolish the entire environment. But this guy can't see through the he can't see the woods for the trees. He's too obsessed with his own. Um, he like what he does what the old saying right. He believes his own press. So because he says that he believes it must be true. He doesn't care what the rest of us are saying. He doesn't listen to us. And you heard Vasi say that to him. 
She said people are worried that they everything they say is falling on deaf ears. Because to them, any to the liberals, right, to the far left, anybody who's not far left is far right. There's nobody in the center in their view. So because there's a lot of people in the center, especially in Canada, a country that, you know, is always willing to listen to both sides of the argument, the, the center is being forced to go to the right because they don't have anybody on the left willing to listen to them. And that's what Vashi was saying, that she thinks she, he doesn't see that, though, because he, he, he doesn't care what you say. That's the point of what Vashi said. He doesn't care how you put it. He doesn't care what you're going through. He doesn't care. You'll do it his way or else. That's really what it's, that's, I mean, he might not be thrown in the or else, but what else, what other, nothing we say to this guy is getting through. No matter how many times the PPO runs the, PPO runs the numbers, he still wants to say that the economist doesn't know what he's talking about. No matter how many times people say the electric car, you know, it runs out of power and we can't plug it in. And no matter how many times we say the solar panels are too expensive and they don't last very long. And no matter how many times we say the insurance companies are having problems with the, he doesn't care. He does not care. He just wants to make you think that that couple hundred bucks every three months or whatever is going to, it's not breaking you even, remember. They're trying to tell you that it's making you rich, right? It's putting money in your pocket, which of course is absurd because how can it be a break even if it's putting money in your pocket? Oh, no, no, we're filtering it down from the wealthy. No, the wealthy just have more cars and they have more expenses that are carbon related. So it seems to me that you should be worrying about those things instead of trying to tell me the guy has to, I have to do with less because I don't have enough to, to cover it. But you can't get through to this guy on his $200,000 a year salary that, you know, he gets all the perks and everything else. He doesn't understand what it's like to be, you know, flat broke and living paycheck to paycheck. He has no concept. He just thinks everybody, you know, he, he, he wakes up in the morning and everything he needs is already put there by the person that does his shopping who probably takes a car. <sighs> all right this guy can't this sometimes this guy gets right under my skin and it's not because he makes mistakes it's because he refuses to admit that he's making mistakes he refuses to admit that he's doing wrong by us he refuses to admit that his plan doesn't work and those kind of people it frustrate me you need to adapt you're expecting me to adapt you're expecting me to overcome all of these obstacles why don't you understand that you need to adapt because we're giving you the feedback that you should be listening why aren't you listening to us? We're telling you that the system is giving us a lot of headaches and a lot of problems. We're telling you that the system is making us choose between eating and heating. And you don't want to listen to us because you somehow think that our little bit of carbon is going to overcome the enormous amounts that Asia pumps into the air every single solitary day. Air that travels all over the globe. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.